Hi everyone, my name's Stuart. I'm a PhD student at Hartford College at the University of Oxford um, and my research is in the field of organic chemistry and today I'm going to be giving you a talk which is called Chemistry from Nature, Taking Inspiration from the World's Greatest Chemist. I hope you find it interesting. So the three things that I'm hoping that you guys will come away from today's talk with a greater understanding of is firstly, what the chemists mean by the phrase natural products. Secondly, what role can these natural products play in inspiring the development of new medicines? And thirdly, what role do chemists play in the development of medicines inspired by natural products? Well, let's find out and see. So what do we mean by the phrase natural products? Well, chemists would define a natural product as being a chemical compound or a substance produced by a living organism. Now, if we stop and think for a minute about how many millions of organisms there are on Earth and how many different chemical compounds each organism is going to produce, this leaves us with an absolute myriad of natural products produced by all the different organisms on Earth, whether they're plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, you name it. We can break down these natural products into two classes. The first class uh, is primary metabolites. The primary metabolites are defined as chemical substances which are directly involved in the normal growth or development of an organism. And three examples of these that you may have come across or you will have come across in your studies at school are carbohydrates, uh, which are used as a source of energy um, for growth and development in organisms, amino acids, which are the constituent building blocks for preparing proteins which are used for cell growth and repair, and DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is a chemical compound which contains the genetic code uh, for building up these proteins needed for cell growth and repair. Secondary metabolites, on the other hand, are classed as chemical substances which are not directly involved in the normal growth or development of an organism, but still convey upon it some evolutionary advantage, enabling it to, or helping it to survive and reproduce. And examples um, of these secondary metabolites are toxins, pheromones and pigments. So if we stop and think for a minute, take an example of a toxin. So let's, let's, think, let's think about um, a poisonous frog, a frog that produces a toxin in its skin, which means that if I eat it, I will become ill and potentially die. Producing that toxin conveys no, uh, is not directly involved in the growth or development of the frog. The frog doesn't get bigger and stronger because it produces this toxin. But by producing this toxin, it discourages other organisms from preying on it, thereby giving it a greater chance of surviving and, and enabling it to reproduce. So this is how the, this particular type of secondary metabolite still conveys an evolutionary advantage on the frog that produces it. Now if we think about how a lot of these secondary metabolites work, a lot of them work by binding to proteins. So these uh, secondary metabolites may bind to enzymes or receptors um, within an organism which trigger a biological response. And when we think about it, this is exactly the same way that medicines work. So medicines work by binding to proteins or enzy enzymes within your body, eliciting a biological response which helps treat the disease which you're taking the medicine from. So this begs the question, well, can we get some inspiration or get some ideas of um, what medicines could we prepare to treat certain diseases from the, this huge array of natural products that is produced by all the different organisms uh, in nature? And the first drug that I want to talk to you about today is aspirin, a painkiller. Now, the story of aspirin dates back several thousand years, back to 3000 BC. And scrolls um, from the ancient Egyptians dating back this far refer to the use of willow bark as a means of relieving pain. So if you were suffering from a stomach ulcer or a broken leg, for example, you might be given a piece of willow bark to chew on. The ancient Egyptians had no idea how um, the willow bark had this magical pain relieving effect. They just knew that it did. Um, and so willow bark was used as a chewing on willow bark was used as a means um, of relieving pain in patients over 5,000 years ago. It wasn't just the Egyptians that knew of this magical pain relieving property of willow bark. The Greek physician Hippocrates was also uh, known to have administered willow bark infusions to women in labour in order to combat the pain of childbirth. Hippocrates also didn't know how willow bark had this pain relieving effect, he just knew that it worked. Fast forward a couple of thousand years to 1828, um, a German chemist called Joseph Buchner um, ex was able to extract yellow crystals from willow bark, which proved to be the active pain relieving ingredient. Um, he didn't know exactly, he didn't know what the chemical structure of this, these yellow crystals were, uh, he didn't know how it worked, but um, he knew that this was the active pain relieving ingredient, and he named this compound salicin. Several years after Buchner's discovery, um, another chemist called Charles Gerhardt was able to determine the chemical structure of salicin. And this chemical structure is shown here. 
in the, uh, the drawing, uh, and he renamed it salicylic acid. And if you look at the structure more closely, I'm sure you'll all be able to see why it's called salicylic acid, because we have a carboxylic acid group shown here at the top of the molecule. Moving on now to 1897, chemists at Bayer, a German chemical company, found that by adding an acetyl group to salicylic acid, um, they were able to reduce the, the irritant side properties of the, of the medicine. Salicylic acid itself, uh, was, as we know, um, had, was a, had um, an active pain relieving effect, but an unfortunate side effect was that it could cause stomach ulcers in the lining of the stomach. Um, but by adding this acetyl group, on the right hand side of the molecule that I'm uh, circling here, um, these ch the chemists were able to reduce this irritant property of salicylic acid and they renamed this new compound aspirin and started selling it and by 1950 aspirin had entered the Guinness World Records as the most frequently sold painkiller and even today, or in 2010 rather, aspirin sales were still generating over 750 million US dollars over a century after it was first sold. So this is quite an incredible story of how a natural a chemical compound found in the bark of a yew tree, uh, of a willow tree, sorry, has um, been manipulated, investigated, studied by chemists, and been developed into a drug grossing over three quarters of a million dollars a year. The second drug that I want to talk to you about, which you may be less likely to have heard of, is a drug called Taxol, which also goes by the name Paclitaxel, and it's a chemotherapy drug used to treat breast cancer and other types of cancer. We don't need to go back to the ancient Egyptians this time, we're just going back to the 1960s. Um, and in 1960, the US National Cancer Institute began a research program searching for possible cancer cures from plant and animal products. Cancer cases had been on the rise all across the world throughout the 1900s. Um, and scientists in the US were aware of the potential medicinal properties that certain natural products had and were hoping to find inspiration from some of these natural products in the development of new anti-cancer drugs. A few years after this program started, chemists at NCI discovered that extracts from the Pacific yew tree bark uh, were toxic to living cells. Now you might be wondering why that's useful. Well, if we think about what cancer is, cancer is the out of control growth and division of cells in the human body, leading to cancer tumors, which have an adverse effect within the human body and quite often can lead to death. So if we want to treat cancer in a patient, we need to find a way of killing those cancer cells. And so this was quite a useful finding that a natural product, a chemical compound uh, within Pacific yew tree bark um, could be toxic to living cells. Uh, and the most potent of these compounds was isolated and named paclitaxel. A few years after its discovery, the chemical structure of paclitaxel was elucidated. The chemists were able to discover what the chemical structure of paclitaxel was. I've drawn it, it's shown here at the bottom of the slide, and I'm sure you'll all agree it's an awful lot more complicated than the structure of salicylic acid. We'll have a little bit more of a closer look at the chemical structure of paclitaxel later, but for the moment I'm just talking about how the chemists were able to ascertain the full chemical structure. Of paclitaxel. A few years after the discovery of its chemical structure, NCI researchers were able to confirm that paclitaxel is indeed effective at killing cancer cell tumours in mice. So this is an important step on the way to developing this compound as a chemotherapy drug, first by ensuring that it's able to kill cancer cell tumours in a living organism, whether it's a human, a mouse or whatever. And a couple of years after that, a biochemist, Susan Horowitz, was able to discover the mechanism by which paclitaxel kills cancer cells. And this was a really important discovery on the way to ensuring that paclitaxel could be given safely to humans as a drug. Because if we didn't know how, it was got, how this drug would operate um, in killing cancer cells, it couldn't really be considered safe to give to humans in, um, for worries that it might cause unwanted side effects. So this was a really important discovery. Um, along the development of paclitaxel towards um, the chemotherapy drug that it is today. There was a problem though, which was that until, until the 1990s, there wasn't a sustainable source of paclitaxel in order to use it as a, widely, as a widespread drug. In order to get a single dose of paclitaxel to treat a cancer patient, all the bark of a Pacific yew tree had to be stripped from the tree uh, in order to extract the paclitaxel. And this in the process would kill the tree. So if we're trying to produce a drug which every time we need to give one dose to a patient we have to kill a tree for it, that's not really a sustainable source of the drug. So it was a huge breakthrough in 1992 when the chemist Robert Holton uh, was able to publish a synthesis of paclitaxel from another natural product intermediate called 10 diacetyl -bacatin. Now whereas paclitaxel could only be isolated from the bark of a Pacific yew tree, diacetyl bacatin could be isolated from yew tree needles which simply fall off the tree. So they can be, the, the 
diacetylbacatin can be sustainably resourced. It only took halt in a couple of small modifications to convert diacetylbacatin into paclitaxel. And it was after the development of this new sustainable way of synthesising paclitaxel that the drug was approved by the FDA for the treatment of breast cancer. And eight years later, by 2000, the annual sales of Taxol, which is the commercial name for this drug, had peaked at 1.6 billion US dollars per year, which is a phenomenal amount of money grossing in from a drug which had only been a compound that had only been isolated 40 years previously from the bark of a tree. We're now going to take a slightly closer look at Paclitaxel, uh, the chemical structure of it, and I want to leave you, get you guys to all um, have a look at it in some more detail and try and identify the different chemical functional groups that we find in the structure of it. Now, there's six different uh, chemical functional groups that you guys should have all come across in your GCSE and your A-level studies in chemistry. So I want you all to pause the video um, for a couple of minutes, have a look at the structure, uh, it's drawn here in skeletal formula, which you all, should all be familiar with, um, and make a list of the different functional groups that you think you can identify in the structure of paclitaxel. Okay, so hopefully you've made a list now of the different functional groups that you think you can see here in the structure of paclitaxel. Um, and the first functional group that I was looking for uh, is an alcohol functional group. So we can see here in red we have three alcohol groups, the OH group here, here and here. The second functional group that I'm looking for is an amide, which I've highlighted in green. So this is a CONH group, an amide group, which we often find, which we find as the linking group in proteins, but we've also see it here in the chemical structure of paclitaxel. The third functional group is an ester group, and there's several of these ester groups which I've highlighted in blue. So this is a COO group, highlighted in blue, here, 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 and here. We have a ketone group shown here in yellow. So this is a carbonyl group, a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen. We have an alkene, so a carbon-carbon double bond, which I've highlighted in the dotted line here. And the final functional group that I was looking for you guys to identify is a benzene ring. And you can see we have three benzene rings here, here, and here. So these are six-membered rings with delocalized electrons flowing around the carbon ring, which you should be familiar with from your A-level studies. Now you might be wondering off the back of this, um, maybe the next time you get ill, should you just eat some tree bark? Seems like tree bark's got some pretty cool medicinal properties. But hopefully what you're also, you will have also picked up from my talk is the fact that whilst um, these natural products which have been developed into medicines are contained within the, the initial organism, so in this case I've talked about tree bark, but it might also be in other plants or animals, um, an enormous amount of work has been done by chemists to isolate the active ingredient in the organism, to ascertain that it's safe, to work out its chemical structure, to modify its chemical structure, to make sure that it is safe to be given as a treatment or to optimise how to um, ensure that it is effective as possible at combating the disease or to have the desired effect. And this brings me now to the summary of today's talk. So the first point I wanted to get across is that nature has developed an amazing array of natural products which can inspire the development of medicines. My second point is that chemists can play a hugely important role at modifying and developing these chemicals to ensure they're safe and effective uh, to be given as medicines. And aspirin and taxol are two examples um, of medicines whose discovery and development were inspired by natural products. If you'd like some further reading on this subject of natural products inspiring the development of medicines, I've got three articles up here. My first article uh, at the top here is one um, which talks about Robert Holton's synthesis of Taxol, which I was talking to you about just before. This second article from the BBC um, talks about medicines which have been, been inspired by animal toxins. So I've talked to you about medicines which have been derived from extracts uh, from tree bark, um, but this, is, this will give you some more information about some medicines that have been inspired by toxins isolated from animals. And the third article, which is probably the one I'd recommend to you the most, is this BBC article which talks to you about, which will give you more information about the discovery of penicillin. It's an antibiotic which was discovered in the 1930s and has saved countless lives over the years. And it's a, dr it's a natural product derived drug um, isolated from a fungus called Penicillium notatum. That's all from me today. I hope you found my talk interesting and I hope I've uh, maybe taught you a little bit more about natural products and the role that they can play in inspiring the development of medicines uh, in the world today.